welcome to another episode of Hobby Night School. We have the pleasure and the honor of having Cindy Dick with us from On Her Mark Cards. We are so excited. I have been a huge fan for a long time. I saw you on um, Peter Pacman. He Mm -hmm. did an episode with you. And that was actually when I was first introduced to you as a collector. And then I joined Women in the Hobby. And you were in that group, and we, we've we talked a couple times in there. You've interviewed some amazing women, and I, it was so incredible just to hear you kind of talk about that and then to go onto your site and really read your blogs and see some of the other content that you've been involved in. So I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of exposing our audience to uh, everything that you're doing because I think it's so cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being on your show. I think that when we talk, we, we've talked to a lot of people who have hobby notoriety and it's, it's been like refreshing and pretty awesome to come across your stuff when Courtney first mentioned it to me, you know, several months ago, because I feel like we have a pretty well curated Instagram and I was unfamiliar with how much of a badass you are. And so <laughs> I'm truly excited <laughs> to to chat because I think sometimes people don't understand the, the the true capacity and bandwidth that that goes into collecting and who's out there and what kind of collections they have. So truly and sincerely excited to to, to have a conversation with you today. Thank you, thank you. It's, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And there are there are so many unique collectors that have little niches, and I shouldn't say little, but have niches, and it is really fascinating to dig into those. So I read, an, I read an interview. So when I was trying to do my homework and get up to speed on who you are, what you're about, your origin story, I was reading something where maybe it was college time or it was something that you were working on and that you were, and I'm going to, I'm going to word this so poorly. And my expectation is you're much smarter and wiser than me that you'll clean it up and represent it properly, but you were just overwhelmed with an excitement and that you knew yeah. this is a space you wanted to be in. Yeah. That is something that resonated with Courtney and myself because we've each had our own unique experiences with that. Yeah. Can you take us back to the origin story of who you are as a collector and then educate the people who, who are living under a rock like myself who <laughs> don't know who you are? Um, sure. So I have I specialize in, in vintage women's sports cards, and I frame that in a time frame is as far back as I can get. And the first athlete shows up around 1887, 1888. And then I cut off the collection at 1972 because of the U.S. law known as Title IX. And Title IX really impacted sports. And so it's an international collection. Um, It's not just Americans. I've been doing this since the early 90s. So, you know, roughly 30 years, give or take. Um, My collection of what I have, what I own is around 1,800 cards that fit this. The other important caveat about the collection is that I don't do aftermarket cards. And so if it was a card printed of an athlete that was, you know, a spectacular in the 1932 Olympics, but her card doesn't come out until 1970, I don't collect it. Um, And it's just because it wasn't representative of the time that she was competing. And that card couldn't have helped, you know, um, be like a role model or inspire anybody back in the time that she was competing. so those are sort of the things that I look for. And of course, it has to be an original card. Um, the time that you're referring to that, what I phrase is like bubbles of excitement through my blood. I was, um, I was in the process of doing a master's degree in Harrisonburg, Virginia. It was about visual images in, in that it had to do with newspaper coverage of men and women in sports. And so I've always been a fan of uh, the pictorial uh, way of representing athletes and I was out yard sailing so nothing academic at all and that's when I found my first card it was a contemporary card I started looking for more and then along the way I came across this vintage card um, of Lillian Copeland I believe and and it was in a you know like one of these mall sport card shows and I literally just felt like uncontained excitement. And I didn't even know who she was. It just that there was something so cool about this being an old card and that she was on a sports card. And so slowly over, I don't know, a decade or two, I started to develop this niche and this framework of how to focus my resources. And I thought when I hit about 200 cards, I'm like, this has to be it. <laughs> like, how many more can there be? And even to this day, I still find more. 
So a uh, question. So Title IX was your, like, that's where you decided that you weren't going to collect any more cards. Um, can you explain your reasoning for that? And has this shift in, like, female athletes in the modern era made you want to change your, you know, ideology about that? Or, or are you looking at some of these newer cards and being like, oh, maybe I do want to add some of yeah. these to my collection? I do that from time to time, just to kind of stay a little bit contempt, you know, up to contemporary trends. But for me, it was um, sort of the fun of the hunt of finding older cards, they were just harder to find. And uh, the newer cards, even though it was still the 90s, it was a different time than it is today in card production, um, they were just easier to find. And so part of it was the thrill of the hunt. And then the other part was just, you know, on the historical side, Title IX really did change women's sports and particularly at the US. But when you take that change onto the international stage in the Olympics, um, for example, no country wants to be left behind. And you can still see today, like the payoff and the dominance of women U.S. Um, teams and individual sports from gymnastics, uh, soccer, um, you know, softball, you name it. We were right on there, of, you know, one of the top teams in a lot of sports. And so it, I think it has had a global effect. And with that came a lot of pro leagues as well. And so when you have pro leagues like the WNBA and the, and the soccer league, you have cards that come along with those too. And so for me, I just was looking at it as here's a way to look at female athletes in a time where there are few pro opportunities and they really, you know, especially the farther back you go, they really weren't encouraged to be athletes. It was not ladylike. Um, and so to see a company, a trading card company, and this is the big difference of the cards back then is, you know, those cards were used to sell a product. So to see that they were picking and choosing female athletes on cards to promote their product and to increase sales was a really neat thing. And especially the ones before the twenties as cigarette cards, because women were not supposed to smoke. And it wasn't until the 1920s when they started to realize, Hey, this is a whole untapped market, you know, <laughs> but before then it was like akin to prostitution. If you smoked as a lady, yeah. so, you know, yeah. so to choose them on, you know, to be on cigarette cards was also just an interesting decision. It feels very progressive for that era to have female yeah. athletes on cards, considering yeah. the stigma behind women doing anything perceived as ma a masculine mm -hmm. you know, enterprise. So yep. it, it is, it is impressive. And I do think that your collection being so specific and, um, and really just like you said, historic is important. And the fact that you've managed to curate such a huge collection of cards with these women on them is pretty, you know, incredible. It, it can be overwhelming too. Like when I show people, I, I've learned to say, what's your favorite sport? And then I'll just bring a book of, or notebook of those I, items. Cause otherwise, it, I mean, even for me, just to see them all, it's like, it's, it's a bit overwhelming, but it's a good kind of overwhelming too. So what is your plan for your collection? You... Um, yeah, yeah two, two, two things that I'd really like to see happen. Uh, I'm working on a book. I've got it into a literary agent's hands right now, waiting to hear back from her. Um, if she doesn't, I have a few other options if she's not interested. So a book for sure. And I'd uh, love to have a museum show. And so I'm working with a couple museums that focus on women's sport or women's history to see if they're interested. And, and the tricky thing is to try to time those two together of having a museum show along with a book release. It would be so cool to see it in like, you know, um, like the Met or the DIA yeah. that both have like sports card collections Yes, like in a major museum during women's history month with the release of the book yeah be like yeah no i agree i agree the met does have a, a really nice collection too but i think it's of um it stops around the point where um where athletes were competing and so it's a lot of representation of things like croquet and um you know to some degree maybe baseball but those cards they weren't even athletes and so it's this would be unique. There's also a women's museum coming up in DC. That's a women's history museum that just got congressional approval to be on the mall. Um, and that's run by the Smithsonian. And so, and there's a women's sports museum that's in the process of being built in Florida. So there's some neat avenues to see, hopefully that this would happen. I definitely 
um, think that that would be an important part of female athlete history yeah. is sports cards. Like that is such a huge part of sports in general. And it has been for such a long time to see a, f- a, a female sports museum with a, like such an extensive collection of women before title nine on cards. It yeah. would, I think that like what you're building isn't just like a fun collection. It's, it's like historical artifacts in, in my opinion. It truly is. And it's brought to me a lot of athletes that I knew nothing about. It's through some research, you know, discovering how different countries viewed athletes different than the U S because my whole time, you know, and this is natural, but I've been looking at sports through a U.S. lens and, you know, familiar with the, you, you know, the American athletes and our history, but, you know, why did so many cards come out of Germany, for example, in, in the twenties and thirties, um, you know, did they have a different perception? And sure enough, they did. So it's just, it is a neat way to look at it globally. And I really look forward to it. You aren't lying, Court. There is a creepy baby hanging out over your right shoulder. <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> creepy baby. Oh. Oh, hello. Lala making an appearance. You know, Lala, uh, when you, you, when you mentioned, room. You can go hang when out you mentioned her. the museum piece, I, I wanted to jump and interrupt because Courtney and myself many years ago went on a date night and we went to the DIA and we were going because they were going to be exhibiting one or two pieces of Salvador Dali and Courtney has mm. that's her personal favorite. Wow. And when we got there, unfortunately they weren't going to be showing them the unbeknownst mm-hmm. to us, there was a T206 collection. Someone yeah. that we a complete get- collection is from Michigan. Huh? And it just so happened that we got to see that and it was cool. And so anytime we, we hear about big collections, we were just in Las Vegas for the Mint and there was somebody who allegedly has the the world's largest football collection. They were talking about how can we share this with the public. And so mm. I think that it's that it's awesome that you're, you know, writing something and then also going to show it off because part of having and curating such an incredible collection is showing it. So you said yeah. 1,800, 1800 cards. I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> are these are these graded? Are these raw? What are your favorite? How do you store them? There's a lot to unpack there, but I want to know because we are collectors. Right. And yes, when we get to like now. when we get to like one Zion case, we get to like fifty to seventy five, that becomes daunting. Eighteen hundred, yeah. like holy moly. They're pretty much in notebooks, mostly by sport. Um, of course okay. there's some that are combined. They're always in the sleeves. Uh, some come, come graded, most are raw. And the big reason for that, I think is because they just haven't had a lot of value. And so, you know, collectors that are in the business of selling, aren't going to pay for the price of getting them graded. And now it's only gotten, you know, more expensive to get things graded. So there are several that I would love to get graded, but I just haven't sent them off yet. Um, Yeah, so that's pretty much how I organize them by sport. And then I try to put the earlier ones first and go kind of chronologically. I have a database in Excel and that just helps me track because my my photographic memory, if you will, is pretty good. Like I can see a card and it's like, I've never seen this before or yes, I have. And then there's a few in that gray zone of my memory uh, where I just, you know, I have to refer to my database to see because I don't like to buy cards twice unless it's one from raw to graded, something like that. But otherwise that's kind of a waste of money for me since I really don't sell them. I, the only things I sell are the men's cards that when I have to buy them in a mixed set, um, I'll put the boys back on the auction block. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the collection wouldn't do anyone any good if I just stuffed them in a notebook and, you know, put them in a storage or something. It's like, I do want the world to see them because there's these athletes have so many great stories and it's just such a, a cool and novel way to look at it through sports cards because nobody expects that, you know, nobody expects women to be on them at all, let alone women in the 1920s or so. So you started this, you started the collection, um, not as a, it was kind of like a, an offshoot of something else that you were doing. Correct. Well, I was doing my master's degree right. and I just, you know, because I was a student and wasn't making anything, I was just would pick some up now and then. And back then, eBay wasn't really even a thing. It was like just on the cusp of eBay getting going. And so I went to a lot of sport card stores and sport card shows. And back then, 
um, once they knew that's what I was interested in, and, and it wasn't even particularly vintage for quite a while, they would actually give me, you know, the contemporary cards because to them it didn't mean anything. It's not like today. They, it, you know, truly didn't mean much at all to them to give them to me. So, you know, I just kind of got known around my little hood and um, as time went on and eBay came along and other auction sites, you know, that's where I look at more, you know, as we know, the nineties just decimated the card industry and um, particularly bricks and mortar store. So I, I actually hadn't gone to a sport card show since, you know, I went to the one in, um, I went to the national in Chicago and maybe two here in probably like 20 years. It's, I just don't go much to shows cause it's really hard to find things that I collect because that's not what sells for most, you know, shows and they need to sell, they need to bring what sells. So I don't hold it against them. Yeah. With the, it, with the rise of social media, has that made it in like platforms as such, has it made it easier for you to find cards with the ability to connect with other like-minded people or just an easier search when you're out hunting for these things? I don't know about as much as social media. It allows me to collect with other um, collectors and that's been a neat thing with the Instagram page is to I mean truly I wasn't even in the collector world much I was just doing my own thing and then that sort of um, brought the sport card collectors to me or I or to me to them you know however you want to look at it um, people like Peter and and many others and so once they know what I collect sometimes they have just sent me things I mean Peter's been very generous in sending me things and a few others and um, again, they just know it means something to me and it doesn't mean as much to them. And so on that note, yes, um, it has helped some and even some eBay sellers, once they can see a pattern and then they'll maybe say like, you seem to, <laughs> you know, what exactly do you collect? And I'll tell them and then they'll just send me things privately. So the, the Internet has definitely helped. The reach is definitely there. I oh, feel yeah. Like I mean, Jeremy and I have collected since we were kids, but it never occurred to us to go on to you know instagram and post pictures of our sports cards right ever until like what 2019 2018 and all of a sudden it opened our world up to like a large expanse of people who collect similar things to us or to teach us things about collecting that we didn't know we didn't know because you don't, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're just like a casual collector, like going around just buying stuff you like and not thinking about, you know, the intrinsic value of what you're building and now you've built something incredible. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool to be able to have this connection with other people. And I mm -hmm. find it so, so cool that you've cultivated this huge, you know, just, strictly female collection because there are not a lot of people that do that yeah no I know I've only met a few you know through the Instagram page and um, and most of them are contemporary there is one that you know also dabbles into um, vintage as well and but most people aren't into vintage and so it's neat when the, the people do get excited about you know hearing about an older athlete so I gotta know of 1800 cards yeah. Like, what's the craziest story in acquiring one of them? And what which card is your favorite and why? It's really hard to pick out a favorite card because sometimes it's like the card that's newest to me that I've never seen before. But I think the card that I treasure the most is the uh, Babe Dietrich and Gaudi Sport King card because that was one of the first ones that a dealer told me about and like, how have you seen this card yet? Do you have this card? And that was back in the early nineties, again, pre eBay, eBay um, are just getting started. And so it took me a long time to acquire it. And I was lucky because it was nothing like the prices today. And babe was an athlete that I really looked up to as a kid. You know, I wanted to do the sports that she did and I ended up doing a lot of them. And then, you know, it wasn't until later, I kind of learned a bit more about her personality and her non so sportsmanship. <laughs> um, she was things, so but, cool. <laughs> yeah, but to me, I mean, it was like my childhood um, icon. And so to see her in a card and to finally acquire it, you know, I would say that's my favorite. But yeah, as far as crazy stories, um, I'd have to think about that one. That's a good question. No one's asked me that before. I've had a few uh, missteps with things being sent in the mail and the item never arrived. And that's been unfortunate. And luckily it's, you know, one was a postal service problem. So they got, they reimbursed me, but still it's like 
this, you know, treasure that's yeah. out there. And then the other one I think was just darn right, just outright stolen. And, and that was not of an athlete, but it was of a woman's um, representation on a, on a card. So those are, those are the sad stories. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to think of, I mean, just today, my mom, my 80 year old mom, <laughs> bless her heart, has a neighbor who, um, who got autographs from a few of the all American girls, baseball league players when they were live and you know some of them are well known like pepper davis and so she's like offered me the cards which wow. is nice i don't collect those cards but you know they're autographed so who who would say no to that and um i don't collect them because even though they're then again they're the 1940s athletes but those cards weren't produced until at the earliest the 1980s and that's yeah. just a, a tragedy i think in worlds in uh, women's sports history <gasps> Not to have cards from the day that they were oh, competing. Oh, it would have been so cool. Yeah. And they were so popular when yeah. they were, like, I mean, obviously not right away, but by the time that that league had gone on, it was yeah. so incredibly well received, better yeah. than I think anyone had anticipated it being received. Um, so yeah. you actually interviewed Marilyn Smith, right? Yeah. I yeah. Did. So that is, we had a conversation mm -hmm. about that. Tell a little bit about how that went and how that came about and everything. Mm -hmm. I met her a few times um, through the Phoenix Women's Sports Association when I was on their board. And then when the LPGA came here in Phoenix, they have the Founders Cup and she lives out. She lived. She has passed um, just in the, one of the surrounding towns in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And so she would always come to the Founders Cup. And so I got to you know talk with her again there. And she was just very friendly, very open. And I said, I would love to do an interview with you. And um, she is kind of like that two degrees of separation away from Babe Diedrichson for me. It's like, wow, you actually knew her, you know, you, you shared time with her. And so um, I brought a little bit of a recording group with me and some friends and we went over and talked to her and we took about a two hour conversation and I edited it into however long the, the, the talk is. And so um, yeah, I'm really proud of that video. It's on YouTube. It, uh, it has, it's one of these videos that like had zero flaws in it and it just came out really nice. But she, again, was just such an amazing woman and, and an ambassador for, um, the LPGA getting started and, you know, never said a, a mean word about anybody. And so it was just such a pleasure to get to know her better. I watched that video and I'm going to link that to this video. Oh, thank you. Because yeah. I definitely would love to have more people be able to get um, eyes on that because it was, it was such a cool interview and you're right. It was Thanks. perfect. Zero flaws. It was, a, I mean, my, all of my videos have a flaw. So <laughs> how this came out, like, you know, without that, I don't know, but. It was serendipitous. Let me we tell put you. a lot of time into it too. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, she was a neat, a neat gal and very sad that she passed. And I it think was. there's only one of the original founders that's still alive today. And so there was a movie also about them, I think called The Founders. And uh, it was another passion project from a woman who um, interviewed people that knew them, people, you know, that they were the ones that were still alive and, and put together a really nice documentary about them. It's been really cool, um, wild for me uh, before social media. Mm -hmm. um feeling a lot like I was you know the only woman I knew that collected cards because you go to card shops you go to card shows and a lot of times there's women there but they're like not there as collectors yeah so being able to build this community that like Sarah and Ty have built around mm -hmm. the women in the hobby space has made it feel more like a community more yeah. you know I have friends now who are women who collect and you know when we talk about these female athletes they're like as passionate about the female sports as I am versus just a, like oh yeah I collect that because it's actually it's worth some money yeah where yeah. it there's such a difference in mm -hmm. like truly collecting something because you're passionate about the player the sport the athlete the you know the circumstances around how they got to play yeah and I think that um a lot of times with women's sports and collecting women's sports it is truly more about the passion of collecting the actual athletes than it is about the value intrinsic oh in yeah oh sports. yeah I mean it's kind of alarming now to see cards go up for the women's cards because of course that affects my bottom line my pocketbook so to speak but <laughs> uh, yeah I love it when you know I, I almost don't even care what their their niche is just knowing that this means something to them 
outside of the dollar um, because that's to me what it's about. And it's kind of the same of, you know, with autographs, like I rarely ever buy autographs to buy just something with an autograph on it. It's that experience of meeting the athlete and getting that autograph in person. That's the memory and not just owning it as, you know, a piece of paper, so to speak. Yeah. So with regards to that, when it comes to like more modern cards, you would enjoy collecting perhaps like modern cards with athletes autographs that you could get. Is that sort of what you're... Um, I don't actually go after those. I mean, what I'll do is I'll go to Target or something and, and or some, you know, boxed or somewhere that they're sold and I'll pick up a pack just to, you know, see what's going on with them. Um, I see things, you know, from people's posts online about what's happening. But to me, I just feel like um, I think there's a huge difference in vintage cards and modern cards. And the biggest one is the graphics. And so most of the vintage cards are really a picture of the athlete and they don't do a lot around the background. And today, you know, there's it's what I call whiz whiz bangery. You know, they just like they fill up the background. And yes, you have an athlete, but it's really about trying to create that wow effect of the visual wow effect. It's like when we listen to music, we don't want to listen to the same thing over and over and over again. We want something new and we want new visual things as well. So I, I can understand what they're doing. But to me, that doesn't mean anything about the athlete of what's in the background. It just it you know, it just gives you something new to look at. And the other side of that is like when they take the same card, these are contemporary cards, and you've got maybe a silver background or a rarer green background, and maybe that affects value, but it's the same card. <laughs> you know, otherwise, and in 10, 20 years, are you going to really remember that, that, that there was a difference in a particular kind of color? Is that what, you know, is that, is that what touches your heart? It doesn't touch mine. Um, to me, it's really about the athlete and how they're represented. Maybe it's in a pose or, you know, what competition, um, things like that. The decisions that were made back when photographs were rare and not digitized, not, you know, you, you can take a million photographs and not be impacted by the cost of doing that. I think this is for it. I'm going to speak for Courtney. And if I, if I overstep court, you can quickly put me in my place, but I think <laughs> at, a collector at least the people we've been around goes to like a journey where it starts with like, Hey, I just like a player or I like a team. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like this card because it's cool looking. And yeah. as they're in this space longer and longer, their tastes start to adjust a little bit. And one mm -hmm. thing that we've been gravitating towards is like the story behind the card, which is not this one, but this showcase is filled with stuff like that. They're not the new sexy flashy looking card that everybody's chasing, right. but there is a, a story behind it, how this card came to be something unique in the printing process, like a, a story about who was involved. And I feel like at our, the way in our journey of collecting, I feel that's kind of like where we're at right now. So like this conversation hits home with us, at least in my opinion, because you know, what I'm hearing is yeah, all that flashy stuff is fine. And if that's what you like, cool but you like the story that goes into it or yeah. like the picture is just like, that's who the athlete is. That's what they were doing at that day and time. And I just, I think it's, it's, it's really cool. And it's, I, I think it's a part in this space that's not talked about enough, or at least it just doesn't get the, the, it deserves. There's not enough whiz bang around it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Whiz bangery. <laughs> whiz bangery. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Yeah, and they, you know, they, a lot of them, you know, weren't posed. They weren't posed pictures. It might have been just like during a competition or after a competition or, you know, it, it just, it, there was just a different time in photography too. And I'll just mention this since you mentioned journey. Um, for me, when I started, my journey was that I wanted cards uh, besides all the, you know, the, the genre of framework, but I wanted actual photographs because that to me proved that they were really there. And what I found was that most of those cards were black and white and my eye just kind of got tired of just looking at black and white. So then I opened it up to things like caricatures or drawings or lithographs and um, things that had some color to it, even though, and sometimes they were colored photos, but you know, things that had a different look, there's some really funny ones of, 
the character, you know, of the big head and the small body or even putting them on like a fish because she's a swimmer. And so there's interesting things like that, that are, that give it some personality. There is a lot. I mean, when you look at cards, especially with the way that you're cultivating yours and, you know, the curation over that like specific time period, Mm -hmm. you can actually see the, the, change in culture as far as art goes yes as far as photography goes as far as you know um like you said the caricature with the big heads or like the weird fish things like stuff that in that time was totally normal and everybody was like oh yeah this is like a a normal thing and we now in you know the lord's year 2023 would look at that and be like that is really weird you know yeah i think that was their effort to, to to stand out you yeah, know, just like we are today. That was what they were trying back then. It's fun. It, it's it, it, is. it is. They're like, I think sometimes people forget, um, especially with the craze of the modern, ultra modern cards, is that someday, someday in like 40, 50, 60, 70 years, when they look back at the cards that we're, you know, creating now, um, it's going to look weird to those people. <laughs> They'll be like, why? Yeah, yeah. Why is this like a, a nebula? What is with yeah. all these sparkles? Right. Well, these people just couldn't take a picture of someone doing a sport. They had to put like razzle <laughs> dazzle on it. <laughs> yeah, I just hope the day never comes that it just becomes di- digital because there is something really neat about holding it in your hand and being able to hold it. You know, it's a tangible object because digital can just go away. You know, the the storage is is might not be there in the future. You just don't know. Like how many digital things today can you not access because that we just don't have the backward technology for it so i'm very thankful a lot that the photos from my cell phones in the early 2000s are just no longer accessible (laughs) (laughs) there's there's the plus side too there's the plus side too yeah we could could never let our kids get a hold of those court no no like mom what what were you wearing i don't know (laughs) cool So, no, that makes me laugh. But you're right. And and I agree with you as far as when it comes to, like, I know NFTs are cool and people like them. And, like, no no hate on NFTs for the people that collect them uh, or are into that. But it is. For me, it's tangible. I like being able to hold a card. I like being able to look at it. Like, being able, you know, we had had done an episode recently with Alex from Sports Cards Daily. And he was talking about the smell Mm -hmm. of cards and, like, how you can tell – if a card is an authentic vintage card, yep. just by the smell yep. of it. Now I, you don't get that experience with an NFT, on right? You, know, you just don't. You smell your computer screen. <laughs> yeah. I was just talking to a friend about this yesterday because she had this, you know, stack of Life magazines. We were yard sailing um, at her yard sale, and it had that old smell to it. And I was telling her how much I really love it when a card arrives in my mail with that old smell because that is so much harder to fake than a reprint. Um, and so when it has that old smell, I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, legit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm just taking people at their word, of course, you know, that it is, I've actually been burned a lot more from trying to buy photographs than, than sport cards. So I'm hoping that they're all the real thing. I'm curious. You mentioned earlier that we, you know, people look at things through the lens of being an American in American sports. Mm-hmm. As we've collected, we've recently started buying some Futera cards. They've produced, you know, some soccer cards and some F1 that aren't really spoken about too much in common hobby space. Mm-hmm. We've also dabbled in Panini stickers, yeah. which how those are utilized and slapped around is completely different than the way Americans would look at a, a, a card. I'm curious, what did you learn as you started looking at, you know, cards from different countries like how are they viewed what mm-hmm. are some like unique things that you learned about that you can share with us or you could educate me well i think the biggest one is just this you know proliferation of the german cards and you know especially in the 20s and 30s and so p- kind of a cornerstone of the book is to try to understand some of the socioeconomic standards that women were having to live with in these countries at the time and germany you know got just destroyed in world war one and it and it really affected their population and so they were trying to rebuild it and this is of course before the nazi era and before the 36 olympics so they're trying to rebuild their population and one of the ways to do this is by realizing that you know strong women make strong babies and so there was 
you know, this slow breaking down of the barriers of allowing women to participate in sport. And one of the biggest ones was track and field. And so track and field in the U.S. had some, you know, groups for it, like the AAU, but in the, on the like the PE side of teachers of women in sports and girls in sports, they were adamantly against it and they organized against it. And they, you know, they wanted play days and they wanted no competition and they wanted people not to like buy tickets to see them compete. And so it was all about participation, but not competition. And so, you know, these two countries are going in very different directions, whereas Germany is like, you know, opening the clubs to women and to participate in track and field. And so, you know, one of the reason why I do show a lot of cards from Germany and particularly of track athletes is because they're a lot out there. Um, and so that was one of the, the eye openers was to realize that not all countries were um, anti-sport, if you will, on, on the societal level in, in these early decades of the 20th century. I mean, a lot of them still had the stigma of being masculine and there's definitely um, sports that were more acceptable than others. But track for the U.S. was not one of those until about the 1960s did, you know, women start to be more accepted in it. And I mean, I'll give you an example. And the longest distance women could even run in the Olympics was the 200 meters until the 60s when they brought back the 800 meter run. Um, so just just, you know, field events and see I go on and on. So that was one of the biggest learning lessons. Um, another one was one of my, uh, I have a German uncle and he was translating a lot of my German cards years ago. And through him, he realized that there was this women's only Olympics. And that was like, uh, uh, aha, you know, wow, what's going on here? I've never heard about this. And there's actually two. Uh, one was the one represented on the card and that was in 1931 in Italy. And it only happened once. But then I have a string of cards that reference this women's Olympics which became the Women's World Games, which was a, four times it happened in Europe. And I think because the U.S. only participated in it in the first one, um, we don't hear much about it. But that organized because they were really frustrated at the number of sports that women could compete in back then. And so to find cards that actually show and reference, you know, competition in both of those is just pretty mind blowing. It is so <laughs> wild to me to like hear you talk about this. And actually, I did not know about the the one in Italy. I did, you know, obviously I knew about the Women's World Games. But mm -hmm. um, to think, like, how far we've come, yeah. but also, like, how how we're still fighting some of the same battles. Yeah, yeah. It's so, it's so like, it's both, yeah. like, it's so nice and also utterly frustrating. <laughs> When you know the history, it's like, haven't we been down this road before? Like, haven't we advanced? And it's like we three are, steps forward. Oh, steps I know. Back. <laughs> We're making so, advancements, but sometimes it's just like, oh, you gosh. still, it's still like, if you're really, mm -hmm. really great at a sport, you get called, you know, manly. Right. And not in a like nice way. And then, or women's sports are boring and not competitive and, and all of that, which we all know is completely un, mm -hmm. un inaccurate and, mm -hmm. you know unrealistic but it is it's so crazy to like listen to these stories about these female athletes that like fought all these battles and know that we still have female athletes that are still yeah. fighting these yeah. same battles yeah women's soccer equal pay <laughs> you know, it's, <sighs> it's yeah it still is happening but we are making progress and that's so much a good progress. thing oh for yeah, sure that's a good thing and i think the visual um, imagery is really important um whether it's on tv or a newspaper article or sports cards, there's something about when you're in press, you're real and you're magnified. And so I think any kind of um, press helps. And that's one of my theories with these old sports cards is they might have been as important as a media source as newspapers and maybe even more so because they got so little coverage in newspapers. Um, and yet here's, this, you know, these tobacco cards that are being passed around from maybe the father to their kids or who knows what, that they can now see these athletes. And it, I think it just showed girls and women in particular, but all of society, like another way of being that they might not have seen otherwise. And that's really hard to prove. It's just, you know, in my head and it's a theory, but makes me I wonder. It's a sound theory. And also, you know, they exist. Yeah, there's, they they, they now have they have created a historical reference point that is tangible that we can see. Yeah. It is a piece of history that we can pass along and learn from. So yeah. 
regardless of whether or not at the time they were aware of like the impact that they Mm -hmm. were having Mm-hmm. The fact that we can look back at them and say this was impactful. Right. And I don't think they were aware. I mean, some of them might have been, but the the stories I've read is more like they just really loved competing. <laughs> yeah. And I even went to um, so a cool. talk. <laughs> they did. I mean, I even went to a talk for some of the women's softball players, not the baseball league, but there was a huge softball league here before. No, maybe they were part of the all American girls baseball league, but um They just, I asked them that. I said, did you realize, you know, the impact you would have? And they're like, no, we just like to play. (laughs) And not to take that away from them. I mean, they just didn't, I think some do. I mean, Althea Gibson certainly did. She she understood that she was being um, used as a representative for her people and her community. She really, she, Althea is, she is an incredible, like, like, she's an incredible person. Like, like her story is, it's just it's outstanding. She was a, a brave woman. So. Yeah. And it's really interesting in the cards. And again, this is why I only compete. I only collect the ones that were printed around the time they were competing because there's so many aftermarket cards of her because now it's acceptable, but the only two I've ever found were printed in England. So she was the first person of color to break the color barrier in tennis. And it happened in Wimbledon, but where are the American cards? You know, of course and, there's not American right? Because I, I mean, I think it speaks to, I think it speaks to racism. Um, sure, not a lot of women were on cards back then, but it was Althea Gibson. Come on, you know, I mean, they, they knew the significance of this. Yeah, they knew what they they knew the significance of her card, and they also knew the significance of not having. A card. Yes, exactly, not representing um, the first woman who won an Olympic gold medal that was black, 1948 doesn't get a card that I've seen until like, I think it's 1996, give or take. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it is a fairly white collection. That's the one, you know, unfortunate thing, but it also represents who was allowed into sport at the time and, and what the manufacturers were choosing. And so we don't see many women of color until probably the sixties, a sans like one Japanese runner from the thirties, one Spanish tennis player. I mean, there's just not many out there. And so that's, that's the unfortunate thing is I wish it did have, you know, a wider representation, but again, these companies are picking what they think will sell. It would be nice to see someone curate a collection of these black athletes, Mm -hmm. even at like the aftermarket ones. Yeah. um, Yeah. Just because they should be represented. And it is a, it's it's disheartening to to know that in their time they weren't represented it but it is nice to know that like now that they've gone back and seen the error of like not mm-hmm. recognizing these athletes for the greatness that they had it's just, it's just it's so disappointing and yeah. in, and again this is another point of like these cards are pieces of history Mm -hmm. and we can look back and be like this isn't the representation of the future that we want we want to see the athletes that are doing the hard work and and putting in the effort and being competitive in their time yeah yep represent history you know or the present but it becomes history of course and accurately right 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 yeah indeed so this is just absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you're intrigued. I feel, I feel like I, I feel like I'm like drinking from a fire hose because there's just so much to like. I pride myself on knowing sport mm-hmm. and knowing that some of this stuff took place, and I was completely ignorant or had no idea that it happened. Is it's bothersome because clearly, you know, clearly things are skewed sometimes, and information's not shared. Uh, cleanly and concisely, but it also, you know, it makes me appreciate what you've done and it makes me want to like, you know, probably send you a message afterwards. Like who are other people who are collecting in the same manner Mm -hmm. as you, maybe different, different collections. Mm -hmm. And now I have a feeling I'm going to be going down a rabbit hole and learning some stuff. I had no (laughs) idea. The nature of this beach (laughs) is full of rabbit holes. (laughs) Enjoy the ride. Yes. I you know what a... you you were saying uh sorry court you were yeah, talking about like the the athletes saying they just absolutely love to compete. Mm-hmm. They just love to compete. We've identified that our 5-year-old Kaya 
is that we're, we're a pretty athletic family. Everybody participates in sports that we always have something going on, but she is the absolute competitor. She wants to play every sport and wants to be the absolute best at it. So it's just a, she hates, you know, Oh, <laughs> she, she does. She loves winning, but she does. She doesn't love winning as much as she hates losing. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny. She's I think so you know, that, like, you know, you were talking about them wanting to compete and like mm-hmm. loving to compete. The love of competing pushed some of these women into spaces where they weren't welcome. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. where they're by nature, their competitive nature is what probably got them to be where they're at because they just wouldn't give up and I think that is they're trailblazers and that's something like in and of itself that gets missed in this is these women were the trailblazers of the progress of women and and equality in not just sports but across the board and things so it is it's it really just gives me goosebumps and chills when you think about it and you start really talking about like the impact that a lot of these female athletes have had on who I am today. Like, yeah. who, like I'm sitting here having a conversation about these women who are on sports cards who were literally doing something that no other women had ever done. Gertrude Ederly, for example, yes. you know, swimming the English Channel faster, not only swimming it, but faster than any man had swam before. Um, yeah, yes. that was like, you know, but I mean, I don't know if people believed it or not, but I mean, she was the first woman that got a first person or first woman. I'm not sure. Got a ticket, t- ticker take parade in New York city because of that. I think she was the first person. Yeah, I think so too. I want to say that it, it was a, I'm pretty a big sure accolade, she was, but yeah, I'm pretty sure she was yeah. the first person. Yeah. So that I mean, just to, 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 to their, um, pursuits you know challenged the norms of where people were saying that women had to be and a lot of that came out of the victorian age just really rigid of what a man was what a woman was and you know slowly 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 that got eroded over the decades and sport was a big part of that historically women weren't and it was it was the victorian era that kind of swayed that because prior to that women were athletic they were the you know there's been proof scientifically that women were out hunting not just the gatherers it's so it's so much that like we don't understand and that's why it is important sports cards whatever to document this time because that's what we're passing on to future generations for them to understand you know like you said all this digital stuff could someday go away Mm -hmm. who Mm -hmm. knows who knows what the future holds Mm -hmm. but you're always going to have magazines and sports cards and you know ours are in little pieces of plastic now so it's mm. not going to break down as easily. That's as, right. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, uh-huh. but it's like little pieces of history and art. Right. They, and they truly are. They truly and are. This has been such an incredible conversation, Cindy. Is there anything else that you wanted to like say before we, uh, we wrap up this evening? Um, no, I was just going to say, it's just so nice to talk to collectors that get it and, and not just like, are excited about women's sports, but they get the whole thing with sports cards. Cause sometimes I fight even with in myself mostly is, you know, this, this trying to take this seriously. Like it's not just a kid's hobby. It never even started as a kid's hobby. Um, and somehow at some point it became more of that, but they are little treasures of history. And, and so it, yeah, I love talking to people that really understand that. And especially think, when you when you're excited about you know the women's angle of it too, that's that's a bonus. <laughs> One thing that we've learned a lot is there's a infinite amount of ways that you can participate in the hobby. Yeah. And the older I get, the more of an appreciation I have for people who do it different than I. Mm-hmm. And I find your story to be absolutely fascinating. I look forward to watching the YouTube video that Courtney told me to watch about a million times that <laughs> I now am regretting for not doing so. But um, I, I, I think I think what you're doing is awesome. I can't wait to see it in a museum. I can't wait to read print. And hopefully this is not, hopefully we get to chat again because I, yeah, just from yeah, a collector, definitely. like I have a million other questions that I'm sure would bore most people, but is absolutely fascinating to me. Oh, I'll so. talk anytime. <laughs> oh, I have questions for you all too, so. 
Good. We'll do a Cindy Dick part two <laughs> okay. in the near future after right. Jeremy wraps his mind around the questions he wants to get, the, the litany of questions he is going to give you. <laughs> Well, thank well, you, you so you much. You threw me off, Courtney, with your creepy daughter hanging over <laughs> the back of your shoulder. <laughs> I didn't know what you were saying at first. I'm like, I couldn't see. Am, is it my shoulder? <laughs> I don't have children. A creepy baby. What? <laughs> and then I saw her. <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, well, well, we thank appreciate you. So much. you. Yes, appreciate uh, you too. Thank and you very much. I will link all of your stuff in the the notes of this. Um, where, what is your Instagram? That, so uh, most people yeah, so it, um, you, when you started the show, you you introduced me as um, being part of On Her Mark, and I did start On Her Mark, and that was kind of a creative outlet and for me to learn a little bit about business too, because um, I work at a university, so I'm fairly institutionalized in that. But I wanted to learn about business, and so I started On Her Mark, um, and then the Giant Legends, which is the moniker in the in the in the video here, that's where I only post, you know, the vintage women's cards. And so on her mark, Instagram might have, you know, other things in it. Um, sometimes it's products, sometimes it's stories. I'm working on a really neat blog right now, for example, but giant legends is where the vintage cards lie. And I probably only have like maybe a, you know, a very small percentage, one or two or so percent of my collection on that. But otherwise I just don't have time to like post all the time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the distinction between the two. Okay, excellent. So I will make sure. The cool I, thing, though. So many. So I'll just, I'm going to link everything. So because you guys should just follow Thanks. her everywhere. She's <laughs> incredible. Thank you. It's an awesome page because most of the posts have like a long story yeah. of the significance of the card, which mm -hmm. helps somebody who's an idiot like me get schooled and get educated. So uh, it's an awesome page and I hope, well, I hope people follow. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. No problem. No, Good thank night. you. All right. If you guys enjoyed this interview, please remember to like, follow, and subscribe so that you can get more content like this. Until yeah. next time, bye. <laughs>